Number one, Roman Catholicism is false and anti-Christian doctrine because of the Mass. I'm going to read to you several, and by the way, I want to be an honest church historian. I did work for many years on my Ph.D. in church history, and I don't think that you win an argument by misrepresenting or falsely quoting someone. The Word of God stands totally on its own. It does not need any defense. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, the Bible is like a caged lion. You don't have to defend it. You just let it out. It works on its own. So basically what I'm going to do for you tonight, and I would suggest that if you're a passive listener that you get active tonight, you dig down in the bottom of that purse by all the gum wrappers and find your pen. And you find a, a, a pencil or pen and, and jot down some notes, underline a few verses in your Bible, even go so far as to write in the back Roman Catholicism and write a few key verses because you need to be prepared at any time to speak the truth in love to the people that, that, that you love, that you live next to, perhaps that live in your home, perhaps that, that are at all your family parties, at every baby shower and wedding you go to. And God perhaps will give you the opportunity of opening your heart to some of them. And you need to lovingly, firmly, and unapologetically present the truth. Let the line out of the cage and confront them with the gospel. Romanism, first of all, is false because of its doctrine of the Mass. And I'd like to read to you from the creed of Pope Pius IV, Pius, as they say it, Pius, I like to call him, the fourth, who summarized the findings of the Great Council of Trent. And his fifth article, which is, is obtainable in probably any library, and definitely you could go down here to see uh, Father Nick and ask him, he'd give it to you. But Article 5 says this, The Mass. Then in, and I quote, The most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, there is truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll end the quote there for just a second and tell you that they actually believe that all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells that host. I'll explain that to you more. I continue quoting. And that there is made a conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood, which conversion the Catholic Church calls transubstantiation. I also confess that under each kind alone, Christ is received whole and entire and a true sacrament. That's an official, and that's the end of the quote, an official writing of one of the popes of Rome which has not been abrogated, has not been set aside, has not been lessened or diminished, and Vatican II only reaffirmed the absolute concurrence of all the college of cardinals and all the bishops of the whole Catholic Church with all that the Catholic Church has always believed. It was only window dressing. It was only siding they put on at Vatican II. They, they changed the Mass to English instead of Latin or the vernacular language. They they got rid of the kind of uh, difficulties with the Friday uh, fish stuff, but they didn't change the poison. No one will go to hell because they eat fish on Friday. No one will go to hell because they listen to services in Latin. They'll go to hell if they believe that a man can do this. And I, I read to you from a mass book. And this isn't secret stuff. This is obtainable by anyone. Here's what the priests and congregation are instructed at the Mass. After the words of consecration, the priest kneeling adores the sacred host. I'm not talking about the sacred hosts of God in heaven, the triune, infinite God, the holy angels surrounding him and the cherubim and seraphim. I'm talking about this wafer that's produced by an order of nuns in some monastery or some nunnery somewhere that they have in front of you on that altar. Rising, he elevates it and looking up at the sacred host with faith and piety and love says, my Lord and my God to that pancake. And then placing it in the corporal again adores it. Now, I want you just to think for a minute. Where is that anywhere in the Bible? That quote, my Lord and my God, is from the 20th chapter of, of John's Gospel. And that was when Thomas knelt down, shoved his hand, or at least was invited to, into the riven side and the wounded hands of Christ. 
And he, seeing, believed. And Christ received him, saying, My Lord and my God. It's one of the greatest affirmations of Christ's deity in the Bible. And Christ said, Blessed are those. Well, he said, You're, That's great, Thomas. He says, You see me and you believe. But blessed are those that don't see me and still believe. You know what the Roman Catholic Church has done in the Mass? They've materialized the spiritual. They have, they have made into an object what cannot be comprehended into an object through some hocus corpus mayhem stuff. And I've told you before that the Middle Ages were bound in the superstition of magic, by and large, greatly because of the Roman Catholic Church, taking what everybody knew was just a wafer pancake deal, and that priest many of whom were living a dissipated life, and I'm not criticizing, there were just many dissipated Protestant priests and clergymen as there are Roman ones, but those people that saw him how he lived all week long, as Chaucer said, in the 11th or 12th century, whenever he wrote his Canterbury Tales, he said, if the gold doth rust, what will the iron do? If the clergy are rotten, what are the people like? And if those people that saw the gold corrupted all week long saw him take a piece of normal bread and by going, hocus corpus meum, Changing into Jesus? They said, that's the greatest magic in the world. And that's where our little term hocus pocus comes from. From this mystical pagan rite of saying that by incantation of a few words, you can change a, a pancake into the eternal God. One former Roman Catholic who was born again, wrote this, the priest in the congregation actually worship the little pancake God and call it my Lord and my God. No wonder I can't help but call it the mockery of the Mass. Let me continue reading from the Council of Trent. Council of Trent, 1545, 1569, something like that, was the codification of Roman Catholicism. The Reformation was... was at full steam, Martin Luther was seeing the nations of Europe bow before the God of the Bible, and the Roman Catholic Church says, we've got to stop this. So the Council of Trent made 120 affirmations of Roman Catholic doctrine. They anathematized. You know what that means? They damned anyone who didn't believe what they said. This is what Trent says. In this divine sacrifice, I'm talking about the priest holding that host, is contained and immolated in an unbloody manner, the same Christ who once offered himself in a bloody manner. Hmm. This is truly propitiatory, for the victim is one and the same, now offering himself by the ministry of priests, not for the sins of the faithful who are living, or not only for the sins of the faithful who are living, but also for those departed in Christ, but not yet fully purified. What does that mean? Still suffering in purgatory. Do you realize that the Mass, they purport, has efficacious salvific, salvation attachments, not just the people sitting out there that are required to come at least once a year, but also for people that are dead, that it's going to help them get to heaven? You understand why Romanism is the most magnificently crafted religion for humans? Why, if, if your uncle Danny didn't make it, you can pray him in. If Aunt Zelda had a little trouble with the bottle, you can burn candles and have masses. And I don't mean to be trite. That's really what it's about. It's very sad. I continue reading. If anyone says that the Mass, and I'm quoting again from the Council of Trent, page 149 of the the decrees of Trent. If anyone says that in the Mass a true and real sacrifice is not offered to God by priests who offer Christ's body and Christ's blood, or that the sacrifice of the Mass is not a propitiatory one, that is, bearing and covering and washing away sin, let him be damned. That is grievous. And that's what the people, if you come down School Street, believe that crowd, I don't know how many masses, a week. 